This chapter is all about SIP, which is by far the most popular VoIP protocol in use today. We'll examine SIP's background and history, look at a typical call flow, and discuss the SIP implementation in Asterisk. If you are not familiar with VoIP, you should make sure to watch the VoIP Fundamentals chapter before continuing on with this one. SIP is actually an abbreviation for Session Initiation Protocol. It may surprise you to learn that SIP was not specifically designed for the purpose of IP telephony. It was created in the 1990s as a method of setting up and managing various types of generic multimedia sessions. While it can manage video streams or text-based messaging, its most common use is to handle voice traffic. The SIP protocol in widespread use is version 2.0 and is primarily defined by the IETF specification RFC 3261. Numerous other RFCs update or extend the base protocol. Reading an RFC is not for the faint of heart, but it can occasionally be helpful to reference the protocol specification while trying to understand or debug why a SIP application behaves in a certain way. Dozens of companies have implemented SIP in a wide variety of both hardware and software, including desk phones, cordless phones, mobile phones, conference and paging systems, servers, and proxies. Some vendors offer SIP ATAs, or Analog Terminal Adapters, which bridge one or more analog phones to a SIP network. Of course, Asterisk also implements SIP. A critical point about Asterisk's SIP implementation is that it is a back-to-back -back user agent, or B2B UA, and that it is not a SIP proxy. A SIP proxy is a system that routes a SIP call towards its intended destination, but is never itself the destination. You can see in this illustration the path taken between the two phones only has one call ID. This is because the phone, and not the proxy server, is the destination for the call. Remember that the channel model in Asterisk involves bridging two channels to make a single call. When two SIP phones are connected to Asterisk, and one calls the other, there are two separate SIP channels. Asterisk is serving as a SIP user agent on both calls. Notice the two distinct call IDs. Because it bridges those calls together, it is called a back-to-back -back user agent. Asterisk cannot be a SIP proxy because its purpose is to manage calls. The Asterisk dial plan is a very powerful and flexible tool, but it would have no value in a SIP proxy because there would be no way to connect the calls to the dial plan applications if Asterisk couldn't be the call's endpoint. SIP has several defining features that help to become the most popular VoIP protocol to date. In contrast to earlier VoIP protocols, it was designed by computer scientists as an internet protocol rather than by telephony engineers as a translation of traditional telephony to an IP network. One of the consequences of this is that it is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol utilizing smart endpoints and not a centralized network. Only network connectivity is necessary and SIP call control can be handled between endpoints. SIP is also a text-based protocol, which means its messages are human-readable. This simplifies troubleshooting problems with call setup. SIP provides several high-level request messages called methods. These define various action types such as register, invite, and others. These methods are the basic building blocks of SIP and combined with a series of valid response messages and the help of a few other protocols give SIP robust call setup and call control capabilities. No protocol is perfect. Despite SIP's impressive market share, there are some fundamental limitations or weaknesses in its approach. We're not trying to say in any way that it's a bad protocol or that it shouldn't be used, but there are a few things every asterisk administrator should know about it. You may be familiar with the OSI model of networking, which in grossly oversimplified terms divides the complicated system of protocols necessary to implement a communications network into seven layers. Generally, each layer should be independent of the layers below it. As the OSI model applies to VoIP calls, SIP is an application layer protocol, which operates on the Internet Protocol network layer. However, SIP violates the model by including IP addressing information in its headers. To comply with the model, SIP would have had to introduce an addressing scheme that did not rely on IP addresses. This clearly would have been a very difficult task, and almost certainly would have prevented SIP from achieving widespread adoption. So even though SIP inarguably violates the OSI model, it's understood and generally accepted. Unfortunately, this quirk can cause problems under certain network conditions. 
The most common of these are when one endpoint is on a private network behind a NAT, or Network Address Translation Gateway. NAT gateways allow multiple devices inside the NAT to appear as if they all have the same public IP address outside the NAT. All of the address translation in NAT works well at the IP layer, but SIP also uses IP addresses, and there is not a good way to build robust address translation into SIP. So when a SIP device inside a NAT tries to talk to an external SIP device, the external device will see untranslated IP addresses in the SIP headers and be unable to respond appropriately. However, there are several ways to address this problem. Intelligent network devices, such as session border controllers, or SIP-aware firewalls and routers, can often translate addresses in SIP headers appropriately. External STUN servers provide a similar service. Additionally, the SIP implementation in Asterisk has options that can help work around this problem, as we'll see in a later example. A few slides ago, we mentioned that SIP had the help of a few other protocols to provide telephony services. We'll now discuss what roles those other protocols play. SIP uses SDP, or Session Description Protocol, to describe the capabilities of a SIP device. Using SDP attributes, a SIP device can specify what codecs it offers and which communication ports it will use. SDP messages are appended to the end of SIP messages. SIP also uses a protocol called RTP, or Real-Time Transport Protocol, for the actual streaming of media between endpoints. This streaming takes place on a network port that is different than the port SIP uses. The RTP ports used are negotiated in the SDP exchanges between SIP endpoints. SIP control traffic most often uses the single port 5060, which can be changed in SIP.conf for asterisk. SIP requires different RTP ports for every concurrent stream, so a range of ports must be made available. The default port range in asterisk for RTP media is set between ports 10,000 and 20,000, but this is configurable in RTP.conf. To recap, when talking about SIP, we're almost always referring to the suite of protocols that include SIP, SDP, and RTP. SIP is responsible for initiating and controlling the calls, SDP is responsible for describing calls, and RTP is responsible for carrying the media. In this module, we've introduced SIP, the most popular VoIP protocol in use today. We've covered some of SIP's background and history and started talking about the SIP implementation in Asterisk. Specifically, we've described how Asterisk behaves as a SIP back-to-back -back user agent and not as a SIP proxy. We've also looked at some of the features as well as the weaknesses of SIP. In the next module, we'll look at a basic SIP call flow to see how SIP messages are used to establish a call and to provide other services.